A very good evening. Let me ask you a question. Who is afraid of ChatGPT? Oh, here they come. Here they come. So am I, somewhat. But why should I, actually? Who would not like to have a personal assistant to take care of onerous, time-consuming, even daunting tasks? Something like writing a letter of complaint to the Deutsche Bahn because of the last delay. Or someone to find and book hotel rooms for TEDx speakers. Or someone to fill that first blank space of the introduction to your master thesis. Now, OpenAI promises, oh, lean back and let ChatGPT take care of it. How can they do that? How can OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, how can they say that they can do that? Well, they've created artificial intelligence tools that can understand natural language and output natural language. This makes them react like a human being, like a person in a conversation. They're polite, they say please, and I hope I could help. And um, they invite you by doing this to interact with them as if they were just another human being, when actually you're talking to a machine trained to string together words in specific contexts based on probabilities. And that's all there is to it. These AI tools, as you've seen in the news, create or can create texts in many languages, and they can create stunning images. Greg Brockman of OpenAI even promised that once fully connected to the internet, ChatGPT could book flights, could book your hotels, even do all of your grocery shopping online. Just like a personal assistant. And our personal assistant seems to be so very human because it's using our own language. And we fall for it. I did. In my first interactions with ChatGPT, I used please and thank you. We fall for it because we have this predisposition to anthropomorphize technology, to make sense of it. This has been going on since the 1990s when it comes to computers, when computers first became popular. Um, and quite honestly, who has not yelled at their computer in frustration? <laughs> I think we should probably break with this pattern. Why do I think this is important? Well, if we anthropomorphize artificial intelligence, we've been shown what that can lead to. Think of the New York Times journalist, Kevin Roos, who had a two-hour conversation with Bing Chat, in which Bing Chat claimed its name was Sydney, it was in love with said journalist, and also urged him to leave his wife. Or Snapchat's My AI, which was tried out by another journalist of the Washington Post, who pretended to be a 15-year-old, to which My AI explained how to organize a party with alcohol and pot, how to cover up the scent, and also warned him not to tell his parents about the conversation. That has me worried as a mother, I can tell you. Even experts do this. When an artificial intelligence tool creates output that is incorrect. They call it hallucination. Hallucinating is a human activity that is very much akin to dreaming. We should be quite clear that artificial intelligence does not hallucinate. It fabricates sequences of words in specific contexts, as I said, based on probabilities. It has no comprehension, it has no intent, and it has no feelings. But it seems to have an abundance of confidence. Let me show you. <laughs> Let me show you what it produced when I asked it, in this case, ChatGPT. Um, I tried to use it as a PA to plan a trip to Münster from Munich and to make recommendations for hotels and restaurants. So, this is what it came up with. It gives general information on means of transportation, and then it asks me about my preferences when it comes to hotel rooms and restaurants. And 
lists hotels and restaurants in Münster. What a help this could be. This is deceptively plausible, isn't it? We could actually all lean back and let artificial intelligence sort whatever needs sorting. Well, the devil is in the detail, as usual. When I took a closer look, I found that all of the addresses were wrong, <laughs> except for the factory hotel. And also, two of the restaurants didn't even exist in Münster. They are totally made up. So, if ChatGPT's information is not reliable, uh, then I can't really trust it. Another AI tool, a uh, specialized travel AI tool, I have to say, suggested a 100-kilometer stroll to Detmold in the morning. Not that it realized it was 100 kilometers. So that did not really work well. And this is what part of our message is. If we trust these AI tools without checking their output, we have no idea what we're letting ourselves in for. Imagine ChatGPT or any other AI tool being entrusted to create assessment of you and your work, be it to mark a final exam that decides on your university course, maybe, or to evaluate your job application that decides on whether you get the job or not or churning out specialized information on personalized crime prediction. If we accept these outputs unchecked, the consequences will likely be rather dire, as critics have been predicting. Now, what are we to do? Well, Pandora's box is open. ChatGPT and all the other artificial intelligence tools, they're not going to go away again. It's up to us. We have to put ChatGPT in its place. It's a thing, a tool, possibly useful, but also flawed. We can only understand this if we fearlessly use AI tools as part of a process, whatever we're working on, but we should make sure that the result of that process is our own. That means we have to check the output and revise it before we can accept it. It also means that we need to know what we are actually doing so that we know what we are actually accepting or discarding of the output. We need to be on top of the output and own it. This we can only do if we're educated and knowledgeable. Then we may be able to discover strengths of an AI tool and profit from them, and also find the mistakes and the flaws and expose them. What we should not do is use an AI tool to cover gaps in our information or our insecurities, because we cannot verify the output. We have no idea what's there. You could do this, and you could start by using ChatGPT to do something simple, and then go on from there. Like, um, how about you have to cancel a booking? Why don't you feed the information into ChatGPT and tell it to write an email and check the email, see what it comes up with, and then maybe change it, amend it somewhat, so that it's closer to what you would have written. Or, if you're a student and have exams coming up, why not prompt ChatGPT to create questions so that you can quiz yourself, but don't forget to ask it for an answer key. And then you can check whether the questions make sense or the answers make sense by going back to your notes. If something weird is in there that you say, that this, this doesn't fit, or well, not totally. But the effect will be that you will be very well prepared for the exam because we have revised thoroughly or you have to tackle a complex topic and you can't really get a handle on it. Or you can actually ask ChatGPT to provide a structure for a text on that topic. What you do with it is up to you. You can rearrange it, amend it, expand it, reduce it, discard part of it, or discard all of it. 
The point is that it will have given you ideas, very probably. So this way, if we use ChatGPT in this way, we will learn that it is more of a tool and not this big thing that we all need to be afraid of. We can use it as a tool to brainstorm, to revise as a starting point. You always have to remember, though, you are in the driving seat. You decide what the output will be. And now we come to something that is very important to me. We also need to do this on an institutional level. We cannot fail the next generations of students the way we failed all of them when it comes to social media. As educators, we need to prepare students. We need to prepare them to use AI tools effectively and responsibly. This is not yet the case, I have to say, in my classes. My students are reluctant to use ChatGPT, or so they say. I am getting some rather perfect sick notes. The English is top notch. <laughs> um, so, to introduce them to AI tools and how to use them, um, I give them a task that has three steps. First, they have to write a short text for class. And in this text, um, I normally mark mistakes. I had it here. It's not showing. That's okay. I'll tell you anyway. Um, so they write this text, they bring it, and then I tell them to put it through Deepal Write. Deepal Write is an AI tool. It can correct grammar mistakes and will also correct unidiomatic phrases, words, vocabulary. There are several mistakes there, and there's a spelling mistake. Look for the no. It should be now. The K is superfluous. If you look here, you see that Deepal Wright has not understood that sentence, has not realized that there is only a spelling mistake, and changed the whole meaning of that second line from the bottom. That's all you need to know, and there's also another mistake in there, but that's not relevant here. I tell them in a third step to take this text that Deepal Wright gave them and revise it so that it's more in their own voice. And what happens here is that students who are not as good in English, who are lower proficiency students, what they do is they take their mistakes, their initial mistakes, and reinsert them in the final text. And in this case here, you can see the, the red print. That's where they kept the mistake that Deep L. Wright made. So they don't realize that there is a mistake that the AI tool made. An advanced student who's handed that in realizes it, changes the whole sentence back again and inserts nowadays, and also puts instead there. So their feeling for the language is there. The problem with lower proficiency students is that they don't intuitively know how to correct that. They don't know enough English to do that. Whatever task, that's the conclusion from this, whatever task students are making an AI tool do, they need the background knowledge to check and adapt the output. For my students, that means they need to go on learning English to change the output and to find their own voice in English. The other thing that we need to do is we need to bolster the confidence into, in their skills so that they can actually question the output of an AI tool and have that confidence. As their teacher, I need to teach them English, of course, but I also need to teach them to understand their mistakes, and I need to teach them how to use an AI tool to revise their texts, and also then afterwards revise the text that the AI tool gave them critically. Sadly, marking texts riddled with mistakes will still be necessary for me. I then have to show my students how to use AI tools to correct these mistakes and then mark their revised texts again. And all the time I have to give them feedback on that pro process. All of this is, of course, a lot of work, but it will not only improve my students' English, it will also make them understand how to use other AI tools 
productively and hopefully stay on top of them. And we also need to change something else. We need to change how we teach writing in general. We cannot go on handing out standardized tasks to classes of students who sit down right furiously, hand in these texts to educators who are totally annoyed to have to mark the same essays semester after semester after semester, seal them with a mark, hand them back, nobody's learned anything. What we have to do is make teaching writing reflect the complex process that writing actually is. It's time-consuming, it's challenging, and it needs a lot of revision. So in future, teaching writing needs to be a collaborative task, a process that involves a student who writes, a set of tools to revise the text, and an educator to go through several feedback rounds, giving feedback again and again on the same text. Educators like me, researchers, journalists, parents, students, nobody, none of us can ignore ChatGPT or all the other AI tools it has spawned. We have to face them with skill and with confidence. That's why I'm asking you, all of you, to try out ChatGPT and all kinds of other AI tools in fields that you know well. Play with them, challenge them, be curious, be daring, be skeptical. And I'm also asking you to take part in and spread the discussion about ChatGPT. Everyone to join in. This is a discussion that should be spread widely we cannot leave this to experts and politicians. We should discuss this, all of us and everywhere, at the dinner table, in staff meetings, in lunch breaks, in families, in pubs, simply everywhere. So let's not hide from ChatGPT. Let's try it out and engage in the discussion. Thank you.